If you've done any gaming on an 80s home computer, you are likely to be familiar with the contributions of a certain company that started life as automated simulations, but would more famously become known as Epics. Their line of hits were on par with both Activision and Electronic Arts. Sadly, they would become defunct by 1993. Today we're looking at one of their more significant contributions that was not based around the Olympics. It is Impossible Mission for the Commodore 64, today on a very special episode of Cagney and Lacey. For the uninitiated, here's what's going down in an impossible mission. An evil genius known as Elvin Adambender has hacked into the powerful computers of all the nations of Earth, sequestering himself in a multi-level underground lair that, judging by the furniture, also serves as his cozy home. He's locked himself behind a very large door that can only be opened with a nine-letter password. It seems Elvin has started the launch of an intercontinental nuclear rocket that will destroy our world in 12 hours, or actually just six, which is much worse. That's where the acrobatic but unarmed Agent 4125 comes in to save the day, i.e. your player's character. Released in 1984, Impossible Mission was designed, conceived, and executed entirely by Dennis Caswell, who completed the title in 10 months. Caswell is a naturally gifted programmer with degrees in computer science from Berkeley and UCLA. Much of his early work was done on the Apple II computer which he used for his Atari 2600 contributions, mainly three titles that ran off the Starpath Supercharger, an add-on for the 2600 that ran games off of cassette tapes instead of cartridges. When it came time to design an impossible mission, Caswell gathered inspiration from various sources. The idea for the game itself, and the idea of a rogue computer came to him while watching the 1983 film War Games, even though the two works have little to do with each other, if anything at all. Agent 4125's fluid running and somersault animation was the result of studying a book on athletics. The inspiration for the rover orbs, meanwhile, would be familiar to anyone who was a fan of the 1967 British TV series, The Prisoner. And although it was merely a placeholder for much of production, the title Impossible Mission stuck, itself being inspired by the TV show, obviously, Mission Impossible. The only other contributor to Impossible Mission was the work of a company known as Electronic Speech Systems, nowadays known as ESS Technology Incorporated. It was ESS's digitized voice clips that adds that extra layer of atmosphere and creepiness to the game. For example, you have the world famous Stay a while. Stay forever. Also you have ah! and destroy him, my robot. I don't know how long these are, but I'm just pointing at things randomly. Electronic speech systems work in this game, and Activision's Ghostbusters game particularly in the way that it compressed data so that the speech would fit within the confines of the limited onboard RAM, were so successful that they would be subsequently raising their asking price. This meant that Epix had no money or budget to work with them any further on future games. So now that we know that Impossible Mission was a technological Marvel masterpiece, we could actually take a look and see how it actually plays. Now we've, uh, known this game for 30 years, so if you don't know by now, this is... you're in for a treat. Spoiler alert. Well, pop the game in, and uh, let's get started. Thank you. Once you begin the game and listen to Elvin's maniacal ramblings... Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. You find your agent in an elevator shaft. You use this elevator to traverse through the game's 32 rooms. Utilizing the lifts and your acrobatic jumping, you need to explore each and every piece of furniture to obtain all the puzzle pieces. As mentioned, your mission is hindered by the deadly robots. While their lasers do an effective job at destroying you, even merely brushing up against them is fatal. Luckily, you could find some passwords that you could use at these terminals here that will disable the robots for a short time. It's not permanent, so you need to be quick. While you can still pass through the bots while they are deactivated, the orbs will still be deadly, even in suspended animation. The passwords to disable robots and also reset the lifts are of a use once variety. To help you obtain these valuable passwords, you'll find two rooms with a checkerboard computer. Activating it will play a series of notes, your job being to play them back in ascending order. For each successful attempt, you are awarded either a password for snoozing the robots or resetting the lifts, but each subsequent attempt adds one more note to the scale. You have six hours of real time to complete the mission. 
While you don't have a set amount of lives, each death will cost you 10 minutes of game time. So technically that means you could die 36 times before the game ends, but in reality you need a lot more than that, as you'll still need plenty of time to traverse the layer and to finagle the puzzle pieces. Oh, and speaking of puzzle pieces, to successfully best impossible mission, you not only have to be good at action gaming, but also assembling the puzzle. Each card comes in four pieces and can be in any color or orientation. While you can see some patterns emerging as you arrange them, there's still some trial and error as you'll notice the pieces you thought fit together perfectly have no other matches. You have a modem on hand that can call home to orient the selected piece properly or let you know if you have enough pieces to solve one particular card. But that help comes at the cost of two minutes of game time each and every time you use it. A better strategy is to obtain all the puzzle pieces first before proceeding with putting them together. So if you don't have them all, you're not going to win the game anyway, so why bother? Unless you're going for a high score. Assuming you were able to get all your pieces assembled in time, your final task is to proceed to this otherwise unsearchable door and open it to reveal Elvin Adamander himself, shocked at being thwarted. No. 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 Mission accomplished. Congratulations. The game ends and your final score is tallied. Now if you uh, fancy another game, you'll notice a lot has changed from the first time around. One of the greatest features that contributes to this title's replayability is the random assignment of rooms, puzzle pieces, and robot behaviors. No two playthroughs are ever the same. <sighs> Impossible Mission was successful enough to be released for numerous computers and consoles. Most recently, a remake on Nintendo's Wii. One of these ports, namely the Atari 7800 version, was marred by a game-killing bug that would hide puzzle pieces behind otherwise unsearchable computer terminals. This was fixed in the PAL version of the game, but a fix for the NTSC version never materialized before the 7800 was officially discontinued. There were also a few sequels, most famously 1988's Impossible Mission 2, which featured multiple towers and had to contend with more advanced robots and solve some new audio-based puzzles. While it did expand on the original, it was not critically or commercially as successful. There was also a third game, entitled Impossible Mission 2025. This was released for the Amiga computer line in 1994, but its audience was limited, seeing as the Sega Genesis port and the Super Nintendo port were both subsequently cancelled. The Commodore 64 was around for a good long time, but it always seems like some of its games aged just a tad too quickly. Impossible Mission, on the other hand, is actually almost timeless. It had just enough detail to convey what was going on, without bogging down the hardware with unnecessary flourishes. This keeps the control and animation fluid and responsive. Doing some quick action somersaults over a tenacious robot is nerve-wracking but oh so satisfying. Also, regarding the title, it's, uh, it's called Impossible Mission, but really this game is a great example of a near-perfect level of challenge. It can be a daunting game for newcomers, there's no doubt about that, but there's enough incentive to get better. And despite the many obstacles, a flawless run is quite possible. Admittedly, that's kind of a lofty goal. Personally, if I could beat the game without having died more than 10 times, I consider this a good day. If you haven't played this game, I recommend you fix that right away, whether it's via some 664 plug-and-play system, a Wii's Virtual Console, or even through an emulator. I do recommend you have a decent joystick on hand, otherwise you're doomed to fail. Believe you me. Simply put, highly recommended. This is Dave, and I'll see you next time on this chair.